Why is the Duke so happy? Now he is actually feeling relieved because all this while, while, while he was declaring his love for Olivia, he was falling in love with this person who was attending him for these three months. That's why he was jealous. Not because this Cesario was taking Olivia away from him. He was jealous because Cesario was going away from him. And now he feels that there is my chance. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. We are doing a thorough textual reading and analysis of William Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night. We have completed almost all the scenes of all the acts and today in this video we are going to look at the final act which has only one scene. So technically this is the last episode of the series but of course we can always have analysis videos if you request me. It's going to be a very very long video because it's a long scene so I'm not going to waste any more time talking about how you should subscribe to our channel because that we know you will do right. So let's just begin without more delay. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. Now looking at the length of this scene, uh, we feel like this is uh, ideally divided into different scenes, like it should be that way. But we see that uh, somehow uh, the editions, they all present this whole act 5 as one single scene. Now uh, there is no specific uh, mention of the location in case of uh, this scene, but in some of the versions uh, we see that this place is in front of Olivia's house uh, it's a street but the way the things happen in this scene uh, it gives us the feeling that this scene should ideally be in and around Orsino's house because he is like the center of this scene it, anyway that is not uh, much of uh, an importance here uh, what is important is the sequence of events all right we begin with the clown and fabian entering the place fabian is requesting feste to show him the letter what letter the letter which malvolio has written to olivia okay. so that we know about now as thou lovest me let me see his letter good master fabian grant me another request so please don't request me this because I cannot show you that letter. Anything. Do not desire to see this letter. So the moment Fabian says that I will grant you anything in exchange of seeing that letter, Feste says that okay, then grant me this that you will not see the letter. This is to give a dog and in recompense desire my dog again. Why is Fabian referring to this incident? Now this refers to a particular incident where a queen's kinsman, relative, uh, he had this dog and he loved his dog a lot, doted on it and the queen wanted that dog. So the queen said that you give me this dog and in return you can ask anything of me. All right. So he gives the queen the dog, his favorite dog. The queen now says, what do you want? Ask me anything. That person says, give my dog back. So this is the incident which Fabian is referring to. Uh, why is he referring to this? Because when he says that he will give anything to see that letter, Feste says that, okay, then give me the permission so that I can deny you showing the letter. So this is like that incident. Anyway, while they're talking about Malvolio's letter, we have the Duke, Viola, Curio and Lords enter the place. Now, considering the fact that this is some place very near Olivia's house, uh, the Duke feels that the people talking, that is Fabian and Feste, uh, they are from Olivia's house. So, they belong to her household and he asks them, Belong you to the Lady Olivia, friends? Aye, sir, we are some of her trappings. So, we are some of our employees. I know thee well. How does thou, my good fellow? We have seen Orsino 
earlier interacting with Feste in his court. Uh, Feste uh, sang for him and Feste does this part-time job in Orsino's court. He goes there and that's why he is often absent at Olivia's place. He always wants to gather as much money as he can and so he moves around and of course Duke recognizes Feste. Truly sir, the better for my foes and the worse for my friends. So the clown now, the moment he sees the Duke, he begins to think about the plan to get some money out of the Duke and he starts talking. He says, I am better for my foes and the worse for my enemies. Just the contrary, the better for their friends. So usually when we say that we are fine, we say that we are good for our friends and we are bad for our enemies. So he is saying the opposite. So the Duke is saying that no, you are not saying it in the right way. No sir the worse. How can that be? So why are you worse for your friends? What is wrong with your friends? Mary sir, they praise me and make an ass of me. So well, my friends praise me and that makes me proud and they give me false information to praise me. Now my foes tell me plainly I am an ass. Now my friends they try to please me but my enemies they give me some honest assessment of me being a stupid person i am a fool so that by my foes sir i profit in the knowledge of myself that from my enemies i get the information that i am a fool which is the correct information but from my friends i get the information that i am very wise and that's like a wrong thing by my friends I am abused. Abused means I am not treated with honesty. So that conclusions to be as kisses. If your four negatives make your two affirmatives, why then the worse for my friends and the better for my foes? He is saying that conclusions are like kisses. And then he is talking about four negatives making two affirmatives. To stretch this image a bit, we can think it in this way that when uh, two people kiss, uh, their lips are like four negatives who are approaching each other. So they are like affirmatives. Okay. And that create a kiss, which is a positive thing. The Duke is impressed. He says, why? This is excellent. So the Duke praises the fool and the fool says that see you are praising me so you are my friend and that means you are not good for me so i'm worse for you by my truth sir no though it please you to be one of my friends so you are praising me this means you are my friend thou shalt not be the worse for me there is gold okay i'm your friend but i'll not think anything dishonest about you. I will not think anything which you are not. So he gives him some gold. The fool now feels charged up. Okay, I got some gold so I need some more. And what does he say? But that it would be double dealing, sir. I would you could make it another. So you have given me one gold. Why don't you double deal it? Now double dealing is, uh, well, it's a term usually associated with uh, a game of cards, uh, gambling. He is using this term deliberately to refer it to the act of giving the coin. So you have given me some gold, why don't you give me double of what you have given? Oh, you give me ill counsel. Oh, that's a bad advice you are giving me. You are asking me to double deal. Now double dealing also means uh, when you are dishonest. Okay, when you are equivocating okay if you have watched the series on Macbeth you know what equivocation is it's like you speak something and you mean something else so you double talk so that is double dealing uh, so he says that you are giving me bad advice put your grace in your pocket sir for this once and let your flesh and blood obey it please sir for this once don't think about the morality of it just keep the morality in your pocket and take out some coin from there and give it to me we have seen Feste doing this with everybody he meets. 
he did this with uh, well our sebastian he did this with cesario we might feel that this man always is looking for a petty coin or two from anybody he meets but think about it in this way this is a very intelligent man and he doesn't have much of a fortune he is not well placed in this world so it somehow feels really not justified that he doesn't get employed in a proper way he has to depend on the generosity of rich people whom he makes fun of okay that's sad well i will be so much a sinner to be a double dealer okay fine i don't mind double dealing once in a while i'm giving you another coin so he gives him another coin the clown is never satisfied he got the payment twice and he says primo secondo tertio first second third is a good play and the old saying is the third pays for all usually it's said in a proverb that uh, when you attempt to do something you are not always successful but you should not lose hope you should go and try again and again usually a person is successful if not in the first attempt then at least in the third attempt so he is saying that three is a lucky thing people get successful in their third attempts and there is this saying called primo secondo tertio so well you have paid me twice i think you should just make it one more time to make it look good the triplex sir is a good tripping measure even in music we have uh, something called a triplex which sounds good so 3 is always a magical number or the bells of saint benedict sir may put you in mind 1 2 3 so when bells toll in churches well many times they are like rung to thrice so he's saying that well anything good is associated with 3 and therefore you have given me payment twice or reward twice you should reward me once more you can fool no more money out of me at this throw mm, this is like a throw of dice you are gambling with me but in this one gamble you can't win so much you have to do something more in order to get something from me okay and what does the duke ask him to do if you will let your lady know lady means olivia i will give you more money for that i have a condition this condition is if you will let your lady know i am here to speak with her and bring her along with you it may awake my bounty further well i can pay you more my generosity will be more charged up awake if you bring olivia to me so that i can speak to her mary sir lullaby to your bounty till i come again so put that generosity to sleep i'm going to fetch olivia once i come back awaken your generosity what is generosity when you give something to someone uh, okay without expecting anything in return that is called generosity it comes from the word generous it 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 comes from kindness of heart so keep that asleep till i come back i go sir but i would not have you to think that my desire of having is the sin of covetousness see don't think that i am a greedy person but as you say sir let your bounty take a nap i will awake it anon okay so just keep your kindness your impulse to give uh, keep that in a sleeping mood now i'll just come back with olivia so that you can give more money to me so he goes away orsino is standing there right then antonio and the officers enter now here i have this feeling that why are the officers bringing antonio here i mean he should be brought to the court for whatever judgment orsino would make that is why i was saying that this scene logically looks broken up into segments so here the second segment starts the second part you can say and location wise it should have been duke's palace his court 
logically it should have been scene 2 why because in scene 1 the duke asks feste to bring olivia to him obviously the clown will go probably give a message olivia would come and meet us you know at his court that is logical but here we don't see any such division of um, scene or any such change of place so we will just ignore this whole thing and think that okay let's suppose the officers took antonio to orsino's court saw that Or orsino was not there and they had to make a judgment about whether to hold this man or release him so uh, you know they were looking for their duke and they came to know that the duke is near olivia's house and they brought the prisoner with them doesn't look logical but this is what's happening here all the while viola is standing there with the duke right now while antonio and officers they entered the stage viola identifies the prisoner as the person who rescued her okay and says here comes the man sir that did rescue me when did antonio rescue viola remember the time when toby and his people they decided to attack viola as cesario because uh, the knight andrew agucci he wanted to really beat this person uh, because he was getting so much attention from Olivia and during that time Antonio interferes and he was eventually arrested by the Duke's men. While getting arrested Antonio wanted his money back from Cesario. He was thinking that Cesario was Sebastian his friend and Viola had no clue. So definitely she came back spoke to Orsino about this incident that there was this man uh, who well he uh, fought on behalf of me defending me and he wanted some money uh, well he rescued me okay so she identifies Antonio as this is the man who rescued me the Duke looks at Antonio he recognizes Antonio why because Antonio was the man who stood against the ships of Orsino, yeah, there was this business struggle, they had this strife, this struggle over the trade routes on the sea and uh, although other people they accepted uh, the supremacy of Illyria, uh, Antonio stood ground and fought over a long period and that's why he is the enemy of the Illyrian government. Okay. The Duke remembers Antonio. That face of his I do remember well. Yet when I saw it last, it was besmeared as black as Vulcan. Who is Vulcan? Vulcan is the Roman god who is the uh, figure of this smith. He, he, he makes weapons. He's like an iron smith, divine iron smith. And of course, because he works. Uh, with fire and metal his face is all black and dark Antonio's face was like the face of Vulcan because when Orsino saw Antonio Antonio was in the middle of a fight and because of all those uh, fire and smoke of battle his face had turned all dark and dusky like Vulcan so that face is something which Orsino has not forgotten in the smoke of war, a bobbling vessel was he captain of. A small ship is a bobbling vessel. So, this man was captain of a very small ship. For shallow draught and bulk unprizable. His ship, Antonio's ship, was so small that it could not uh, sail over deep oceans and it could not take much weight. So, it was fit for shallow water and goods of no value, Mer merchandise and trade goods of no much, not much value, uh, unprizable. With which, so he was fighting on that ship, which was so negligible compared to uh, the heavily built ships of Orsino. But still, 
with which such scatful grapple did he make. Scatful means such harmful effect he had, such harmful problems he created for us. Okay? He shattered us all with the most noble bottom of our fleet, with the, with the greatest of our ships. He fought, he fought so much and brought so much damage. That very envy and the tongue of loss cried fame and honor on him. That we lost and that loss, the way he defeated us, that showed how brave he was, how courageous he was, how capable he was. So although we felt bad, we felt envious when we lost, our envy only established his greatness as a warrior. So what is Orsino doing here? He is cursing him, he is praising him. He is praising Antonio. So from this kind of expression, we realize that Orsino is a man who appreciates bravery. No matter uh, be it his friend, his enemy, he always appreciates bravery, courage. Uh, and that kind of creates a different impression of Orsino. Earlier we had this impression that he uh, doesn't talk much sense. He has not shown us any sign of uh, being a noble duke. But everybody praises him, right? Why does everybody praise him? Now we realize why everybody praises him. Because he is a man who might be a little insensitive when it comes to love. But when it comes to governance, when it comes to how you deal with your enemies, uh, in those areas, he is very, very decent and noble. And if you have to judge the real character of any person, you should judge that person on the basis of how that person deals with his or her enemies. Because usually people tend to be vindictive and rude to their enemies. But Orsino is being... Uh, really noble when he's talking about Antonio. The officer, the police officer, he confirms Orsino. Now, I don't understand why the officer is addressing Orsino as Orsino. He should say my lord or something. Okay, that's an oversight uh, probably. Orsino, this is that Antonio that took the phoenix and her fraught from Candy. So, this was the person who attacked our ship phoenix the name of the ship is phoenix and this is he that did the tiger boat so he attacked our ship tiger so he entered forcefully all these ships when your young nephew titus lost his leg so in that battle where he attacked our ship tiger uh, your young nephew Titus, he lost his leg. So there is a personal loss here, okay? Here in the streets, desperate of shame and state in private brabble did we apprehend him. How did we catch him? We caught him fighting in a private battle on the streets. That is so shameful of him because he is otherwise such a heroic enemy of yours. Now Viola, interrupts he did me kindness sir so she doesn't want orsino to punish this man much because she feels grateful to him well that private fight which the officer is talking about uh, started because of her and her interaction with andrew and therefore she feels responsible that for me this person is caught so i must do something to stop him from getting punished he did me kindness sir drew on my side but in conclusion put strange speech upon me he really really fought for me he, he drew his sword for me but at the end of it he was speaking as if he is not in his senses okay he uh, put strange speech upon me i know not what it was but distraction definitely this person has lost his mind now orsino is directly addressing antonio Notable pirate. Who is a pirate? A pirate is a robber who attacks and steals from ships. Okay, so they are uh, sea robbers. All right. 
Duke addresses Antonio as a sea robber because he attacked his ships. Notable pirate, thou salt water thief because he is a thief from the sea. So he is a salt water thief. What foolish boldness brought thee to their mercies whom thou in terms so bloody and so dear has made thine enemies. So you have already turned the people of Illyria your enemies by fighting. What foolish boldness brought thee to their mercies whom you have turned your enemies. Why did you come here? Orsino, noble sir, be pleased that I shake off these names you give me. Antonio never yet was thief or pirate. Before everything else, he addresses Orsino as a noble person, as a noble lord. And then he says that, don't call me a pirate, don't call me a thief. I am a rebel. Okay, so he sees his action as rebellion, not as piracy. Though I confess on base and ground enough, Orsino's enemy, yes, I am Orsino's enemy, but I am not a robber, I am not a thief. A witchcraft drew me hither. Witchcraft. Anybody in love, anybody in Twelfth Night falling in love refers to the other person as throwing an enchantment, doing some magic, right? Love is a witchcraft. It's like somebody is putting you in a trance. You don't know what you're doing. We have seen how Olivia is acting when she is in love, she, as if she is in a trance. But Antonio is Sebastian's friend. He is referring to his love for Sebastian almost in the same way as Olivia refers to her love for Cesario. That's interesting. Probably Antonio, I don't know, uh, he might consider Sebastian as more than his friend. This is not unusual in Shakespeare's time, mind you. Homosexuality was something very, very common and acceptable in society. We have seen uh, hints of such uh, emotional bonds between uh, male characters. Uh, interestingly, that person's name was also Antonio. I'm talking about the Merchant of Venice. The way Antonio is very sad when Bassanio says that I'm going to get married to this woman uh, and he doesn't know why he is sad. It is as if they cannot express clearly their infatuation with their uh, male friends. Okay, so these are just hints. We cannot uh, directly say that Antonio and Sebastian were lovers. They were not. Nothing like that is ever mentioned here. I'm not saying that. But the way he's using the word witchcraft, you don't uh, use those words when you're referring to friends. You use words like witchcraft, enchantment, magic when you're talking about lovers. Okay. So he is saying that a witchcraft drew me hither. A witchcraft means something like an enchantment, something which completely brought on a brainwash, has brought me here. What witchcraft? The love of a person. Why was he here actually? He was here, first of all, because Sebastian wanted to move around Illyria and Antonio wanted to look for Sebastian. So Sebastian is the reason why Antonio is in Illyria. This much is the meaning of his sentence. He doesn't know that the person standing beside the Duke now is not Sebastian. That person is not responsible for his arrival. But he doesn't know that. A witchcraft drew me hither, that most ingrateful boy there by your side. That, that boy standing in front of you, beside you. From the rude seas enraged and foamy mouth did I redeem. I saved him from the sea when he was drowning. I saved him. A wreck past hope he was. He, he, was, he had no hope of surviving that except for me. And look at the way he continues to uh, emotionally vent out whatever is happening inside him. His life 
I gave him and did thereto add my love without retention or restraint and all his in dedication. I gave him everything I could without reservation. I gave him all my attention, all my affection. For his sake did I expose myself pure for his love into the danger of this adverse town, this town which is my enemy. I came here because I love him so much, I didn't care. Into the danger of this adverse town, drew to defend him. Then when I saw him attacked by enemies, I went there to defend him. When he was beset, when he was attacked, where being apprehended, there when I was arrested, his false cunning, not meaning to partake with me in danger. He did not want to be with me when I was in danger. He did not want to uh, be an accomplice in the eyes of the police. Taught him to face me out of his acquaintance. He refused. He, he denied any knowledge about me. And grew a 20 years removed thing while one would wink. So this was so strange he he refused to acknowledge that he knows me denied me my own purse he didn't give me my own money which i had recommended to his use not half an hour before i had given him that money some half an hour before that incident and he completely refused to give it to me to save me cesario viola clueless how can this be Orsino asks a very important question here. Uh, when came he to this town? Okay, you were saying that you have saved this gentleman, this boy. When did this happen? When did he come here? Today, my lord. And for three months before, before coming here, we had spent three months together. For three months before, no interim, not a minute's vacancy, both day and night did we keep company. So we arrived here today and before that we were together for three whole months. Right then Olivia enters and we know what happens when Olivia enters and Orsino is there. We can expect Orsino to behave the way he behaves now. The Duke looks at Olivia. He, he has forgotten about Antonio now. He is no more the, the logical, sane, noble duke he is now looking at olivia how can you expect him to act in a very sane manner so what he does is here comes the countess now heaven walks on earth so remember that expression something uh, linked to heaven's rain orders on you okay so that kind of poetic expression here till now orsino was speaking in a language which is very very natural language now look at the way he is speaking he is using all these poetic expressions and then suddenly he looks at antonio um, but for thee fellow fellow uh, thy words are madness three months this youth hath tended upon me um, but more of that anon take him aside please uh, don't interfere in my business now don't interrupt uh, let me just deal with my heavenly divine beloved and let me tell you that if you are talking about this boy here he was with me these last three months so he's definitely not somebody you have rescued so the duke feels that antonio is not speaking the truth maybe antonio is making a mistake here olivia she has entered now think from the point of view of olivia now she is looking at Orsino and she is looking at Viola dressed as Cesario. She thinks that it is the person who is married to me. Because in the last scene what we have seen is that she is taking away Sebastian saying that please come with me, get married to me, later on we will have a huge reception party but now Today, let's go and somehow get married. So now when she comes and sees Cesario, she is addressing both of them. So she speaks one sentence to the Duke and the next sentence to uh, Viola standing there. 
What would my lord, but that he may not have wherein Olivia may seem serviceable? This is something she speaks to uh, the duke that uh, what is it that I can do for you except for the things which you cannot have from me. She knows what she's talking about. Suddenly, before the duke answers, she looks at Cesario and says, Cesario, you do not keep promise with me. Suddenly, the duke is thinking, why is she talking to my messenger? Okay, what's going on? Okay, something is striking there as odd to him. Both of them reply simultaneously. Cesario says, Madam, Duke is saying, Gracious Olivia. And when Viola sees that the Duke is talking, she stops to talking and she feels that the Duke should talk because he is, well, he is the Duke. Olivia, hearing both of them speak at once, she is looking at Cesario and saying, Yes, yes, what happened? So she is more interested in what Cesario has to say. What do you say, Cesario? And then she feels that, okay, she should also talk to the Duke and she says, Good, my lord, it's difficult for me when I'm just one person enacting the whole thing to make you understand how three people are talking together. But you can just imagine that there is a lot of interruption in between. Anyway, Viola feels that the Duke should talk and she says, My lord would speak, my duty hushes me. It's my duty to keep quiet when my master is talking, so I'll keep quiet. Olivia is not interested in what the Duke has to say and she directly says, If it be aught to the old tune, my lord, if you're going to say the same thing again, what same thing? That you want to marry me, you are proposing to me. So it's the same thing again. It is as fat and fulsome to mine ear as howling after music. I have experienced music. Your words will be like howling, something which is not musical at all, something which hurts the ear. What music has she heard? She has experienced the music of love when she has fallen in love with the Duke's messenger. Okay? Still so cruel. So the Duke is sad. Because he thinks Olivia is very cruel. Still so constant, Lord. No, I'm not cruel. I'm not changing my version here. I had always said I'm not interested. And I'm saying I'm not interested. What? To perverseness, you once civil lady? So now the Duke has become very angry because Olivia is not giving him any reason at all. He is directly calling her ungrateful. No, this is unacceptable. We cannot call him a noble person because this man does not understand what consent means. We have discussed that like previously. That he thinks that if I am devoted to you, if I love you, you ought to love me unless you have a proper reason. So he cannot understand why Olivia is denying him that he wants. You one civil lady to whose in great and unauspicious altars, altars is where you place the gods when you worship them. That place is called the altar. So he's saying that I have placed you as a person puts their gods idols. So you are like a deity to me. I have worshipped you and you are so ungrateful. You don't have any consideration. My soul, the faithfulest offerings hath breathed out. I have given you so much of my attention, of my faith, that ever devotion tendered, what shall I do? He is broken. Even what it please my Lord that shall become him, do what fits you. You are the Duke. You should do what a Duke should do. Why should I not? Had I the heart to do it, like to the Egyptian thief at point of death, kill what I love. He is referring to this practice, you know, there's this incident um, where an Egyptian robber chief, he had this captive uh, beloved lady and there was this attack from a rival group. They were also robbers. So 
he felt that he was in threat of being killed and he in turn wanted to kill that uh, beloved of his before the robbers or the rival robbers came in and this whole story written down in uh, this book called Heliodorus's Ethiopica and this was translated by Thomas Underdown and I'm reading from that uh, translation a bit it's it was translated in around 1569 uh, he writes in in this place if the barbarous people be once in despair of their own safety they have a custom so if these barbarous people these savages of Egypt they felt threatened what they used to do is horrible they have a custom to kill all those by whom they set much they used to kill anybody uh, whom they admired whom they loved why and whose company they desired after death because those people believed in life after death and they felt that if I kill my lover or my beloved or anybody whom I like uh, before I die then after I die they will be waiting for me in uh, in my personal heaven and we can stay happily forever so he, they want to make sure that they have their companies or the companions even after death so they kill whom they love now the duke is saying that you are the woman who I love so do you want me to kill you that's so rude but he's saying that so he's saying had I had I the heart to do it like to the Egyptian thief at point of death kill what I love then he changes his mind a savage jealousy that sometimes severs nobly but hear me this since you do non regard and scuffed my faith you are not regarding my requests you're not considering my appeals and that I partly know the instrument that screws me from my true place in your favor and I know why I know about the instrument who is responsible so he knows that it is Cesario who is responsible for stealing away his place from Olivia's heart as if he had a place in her heart anyway so he says that I know who is responsible for taking me away from you leave you the marble breasted tyrant still I will let you live and he calls Olivia a marble breasted tyrant marble in both senses one is because she definitely is very fair so marble is white colored stone uh, with a beautiful tinge at times so he's comparing her to a marble uh, breasted person because she has a white breast another interpretation is that marble is a stone it's a hard substance so Olivia is uh, not a soft person she is hard-hearted because she is marble breasted okay so marble breasted has double interpretations here double connotations here and he says I will let you live earlier I thought I would kill you now I think I should let you live and then he gets hold of Cesario maybe grabs Cesario by his neck okay by, or by his shoulder pulls his shirt or something and says but this your minion, this your darling, your lover, whom I know you love and whom by heaven I swear I tender dearly and somehow I also love. Him will I tear out of that cruel eye. You are having him in your eye. I am going to tear him away from your eyes where he sits crowned in his master's spite he is sitting there where I should sit so I am going to wrench him away from your eyes come boy with me my thoughts are ripe in mischief I will sacrifice the lamb that I do love to spite a raven's heart within a dove so I am going to sacrifice this person in order to please your cruel heart he is saying two things here 
One is that he loves Cesario. He can't explain why he loves Cesario, but he loves Cesario. And it's going to be a sacrifice for him. And second thing is, he's calling her. First, he had called her marble breasted. Now, he's calling her that you have a raven's heart. Raven is, they are birds. They look like crows, but they are not crows. Okay, they are more predatory. Okay, so they uh, hunt other creatures. They are not scavengers like crows. Ravens are not considered to be uh, very good omens. They are considered to be bad omens in literature. And they are completely dark and black and associated with all evil doers and witches. Okay, so he is saying that Olivia has a raven's heart. Why? Because she has hunted on this Cesario and she has taken Cesario away from the Duke. Okay, so it's a feeling of double jealousy that he is feeling. He is feeling jealous because Cesario has taken Olivia away from him and also feeling jealous because Olivia has taken Cesario away from him. And so he thinks that if I get rid of Cesario, I am going to get Olivia. So I'll do that. Olivia is of course very very nervous at this point but look at Viola's reaction. She is not even refusing to go. She is not saying anything. All she says is and I most jokend I'm so happy that you will sacrifice me. I would give my life for you. Apt and willingly to do you rest if my death gives you happiness I will die a thousand times. A thousand deaths would die. And she is going, attempting to go away with Orsino. Think about Olivia. I mean, you are a woman. You just got married to that guy. And this guy is talking to another man that he can die for him. What's wrong with the world? Okay, this man could have said that he is into men when I was marrying him. But he was happily getting married to me. And now he's saying that I can die for another man. The confusion reaches the height of uh, everything. Okay, so here she's so confused. Where goes Cesario? Where are you going? And she's also nervous because she thinks that Orsino might actually harm Cesario. Look at the answer that she gets. After him I love. More than I love these eyes, more than my life, more by all mores than ever I shall love wife. If I do feign, if I'm lying, you witnesses above, now she's talking about gods, okay, you witnesses above punish my life for tainting of my love. If I'm lying, punish me. I am detested. How am I beguiled? Now, detested means uh, technically, illegally, it means when somebody um, does not acknowledge a contract, uh, when somebody refuses to recognize any kind of binding agreement between two people. In this case, she feels that by declaring his love for the Duke, Cesario is deceiving her and refusing to accept her. All right. So she feels detested, de-recognized, okay? And she also feels that she is hated in a way. Cesario doesn't know that Olivia has gotten married to whom she thinks is Cesario. So she is asking, who does beguile you? Who does do you wrong? What's wrong with you? I didn't do anything wrong to you. Hast thou forgot thyself? Is it so long? Call for the Holy Father. Now, she asks an attendant to go and call the priest, the witness. The Duke is trying to take Cesario away, to kill him. Maybe not kill him, but well, punish him. Come away. Whither my Lord Cesario, husband, stay. And then she uses the word husband. And then Orsino feels, husband? Hi, husband, 
can he that deny her husband sira and then the duke asks says are you oh, you are her husband no my lord not i alas it is the baseness of thy fear oh you are afraid to tell the duke that you are my husband so she is trying to understand why cesario is denying the whole thing that makes thee strangle thy propriety to suppressing your identity you are denying that you are my husband fear not cesario take thy fortunes up be that thou knowest thou art so you should tell what you are and then thou art as great as thou thou fearest so you are afraid of this duke but you are as great as this duke why don't you tell that you are my husband and because well if uh, cesario is her husband then cesario has all her property right so cesario should not be a servant to the duke now the priest comes oh welcome father father i charge thee by the reverence here to unfold now she requests the priest to help her prove her point to the people there Though lately we intended to keep it in darkness, yes, I told you, don't tell anyone. Now I am telling you, tell these people that I am married to this person. So now she is asking the priest to tell what occasion now reveals before it's ripe. I know we were planning to keep it a secret, but now the occasion is that we have to let it out. what thou does know has newly passed between this youth and me can you tell everybody what has happened between the two of us a contract of eternal bond of love so there was an agreement an engagement a contract confirmed by mutual joinder of your hands and then after your uh, well um, you can say that it was kind of a betrothal an engagement and after that there was the joining of hands so the marriage ritual is also starting to take place there attested by the holy close of lips so you had kissed each other strengthened by interchangement of your rings you had exchanged rings and all the ceremony of this compact sealed in my function by my testimony since when my watch hath told me like now he's talking about the time when did this happen toward my grave i have traveled but 2 hours <laughs> the way he talks he's saying that 2 hours back you got married to this man and he's saying how is he saying 2 hours he's saying that he has traveled towards its death for 2 hours since then this is how he speaks this is how priests speak and earlier we have seen Uh, the fool imitating satopus and the way he was talking you see the priest actually talks in this way all going round and round and round he could have just said these two are a married couple instead of that is took like so many sentences for us to read orsino is so angry now why why is this information given to us from the priest's mouth first of all we have not seen sebastian get married to olivia so we don't know for sure if they actually got married so this is important not just to prove to orsino but to prove to the audience also that yes a marriage or a wedding did take place okay and uh, well this wedding was off stage so we didn't know or we didn't see that but now after the priest confirms this we know that Uh, olivia is already married maybe there is no occasion or celebration yet but they are definitely married horsino has had enough now o oh, thou dissembling cub so you are a hypocritical cub what will thou be when time hath sowed a grizzle on thy case grizzle is gray hair um, so he is talking about cesario as if he is just a child yet and even in his young days he is such a cheater how much more cheating will he do when he grow older mature or 
Will not else thy craft so quickly grow that thine own trip shall be thine overthrow? Or maybe before maturing, your hypocrisy will overthrow you. Farewell and take her. But direct thy feet where thou and I henceforth may never meet. So Orsino was really not going to kill Cesario, definitely not. He loves Cesario too much to do that. And Orsino is a good guy at the end of the day. He was just threatening. And now he says, okay, you're married, fine. Then there's nothing else that I can do about it. But don't come in front of me ever again. Fair enough. My Lord, I do protest. Imagine Viola, she is in love with the Duke and the Duke is telling her, don't come in front of me ever again. Look at her situation here. Olivia are trying to stop her husband. Oh, do not swear, whole little faith, though thou hast too much fear. She is thinking that Cesario is afraid, scared, and that's why Cesario is trying to please Orsino yet. But now, confusion increases. Andrew enters. Andrew, he comes here after being hit by Sebastian. Remember the scene where Sebastian hit Andrew, Toby, everybody black and blue. And uh, that was the point where the clown, he ran away from the place uh, and uh, fetched Olivia. Olivia came and she took Sebastian away. So Andrew comes here to complain. For the love of God, a surgeon, send one presently to Sir Toby. What's the matter? Has broke my head across and has given Sir Toby a bloody coxcomb too. For the love of God, your help, I had rather than 40 pound I wear at home. So Andrew is really, really, he wants uh, some uh, medical attention right now. Who has done this, Sir Andrew? The Count's gentleman, one Cesario. We took him for a coward, but he is a very devil incarnate. Incarnate. He wants to mean incarnate. Incarnate means when somebody is born as a human being. When, when uh, gods are born as humans, they are called incarnations. Uh, he is saying that Cesario is devil's incarnation. And since he doesn't know English, he uses the word incarnate. Duke is again confused. Cesario? Devil incarnate. What's life flings? Here he is. Yes, yes, that man. You broke my head for nothing. And that, that I did. I was set on to do it by Sir Toby. So I didn't even try to hurt you. Sir Toby wanted me to hurt you. But you broke my head. Viola is so confused. She knows that they were trying to attack her. But then the police officers arrived, took away Antonio. She doesn't know anything else. And this man is saying that she broke his head. When? Why do you speak to me? I never hurt you. You drew your sword upon me without cause. But I bespeak you fair and hurt you not. Now Toby and Clown comes. That is Feste also comes. Now Andrew has his black eye there. Okay, And he's saying, if a bloody coxcomb be a hurt, you have hurt me. Yes, if, if this is a hurt, then you have hurt me. I think you said nothing by a bloody coxcomb. You think this is not a hurt. That is why you're saying you have not hurt me. Here comes Sir Toby halting. You shall hear more. But if he had not been in drink, Toby was drunk. So you could defeat him. Otherwise, you don't know what he would have done to you. He would have tickled you other gates than he did. Now Duke looks at Toby. Okay, what's wrong with you? That's all one has hurt me and there's the end on it. Sut, to see Dick, surgeon, sut. They're all looking for some surgeon, some doctor here. Oh, he's drunk, sir. Toby, an hour ago, his eyes were set at eight in the morning. So, oh, if you are very drunk, maybe your eyes start to get squinty and it, it looks as if you are looking in, one eye is looking in one direction and the other eye is looking in the other direction. So he is saying that his eyes were set at 8 in the morning. Then he is a rogue and a pussy measures Pavin. I hate a drunken rogue. Toby is saying that uh, Dick Sargent who is drunk according to the clown Feste. He is saying that I hate drunk people. When he is drunk he doesn't hate drunk people. When others are drunk he hates them. Olivia is really disturbed by all this. Away with it. Who had made this havoc with them? 
and then all of them leave okay uh, andrew also speaks about uh, all nonsense and then uh, toby fights with him and they leave now sebastian comes he comes and he is feeling bad that he has uh, you know beaten up olivia's uncle so he comes and says i'm sorry madam i have hurt your kinsman just a minute think about the situation on stage here sebastian storming in okay rushing in from one side on the other side of the stage we have orsino standing with viola dressed as cesario olivia is standing here sebastian comes in he doesn't look anywhere he doesn't look at orsino he doesn't look at antonio or anybody he looks at olivia because he has come to meet his wife and tell her that i'm sorry uh, well there was a problem with toby this is what he comes so he doesn't look at anybody else but others are looking at him look at their surprise and shock what does he say i'm sorry madam why does he call his wife a madam i don't know because uh, he doesn't know that his wife has told everybody that they are married. He knows that they are supposed to keep it a secret, right? So he is calling her madam. I am sorry madam, I have hurt your kinsman. But had it been the brother of my blood, if he was my own brother, I must have done no less with wit and safety. But I didn't kill him, I didn't hit him in a bad way, I did it with safety. And while he is talking, what should be Olivia's reaction? Olivia was thinking this man is my husband now her real husband comes and both of them look same and Sebastian is looking at Olivia Olivia is looking with this shock on her face Sebastian after three sentences looks at her and says why are you looking like that at me you threw a strange regard upon me and by that I do perceive it has offended you have I offended you pardon me sweet one now he is saying sweet one so that's an endearing statement even for the vows we made each other, uh, think about the promises we have made to each other. Orsino speaks from one side of the stage. One face. So he's looking at both of them, Sebastian, Cesario. And they are looking so very similar because Cesario is dressed in the same way as Sebastian is dressed. One face. So he's looking like this and this. Once he's looking at Cesario, once he's looking at Sebastian. One face, one voice, one habit. Habit here means dress. And two persons. A natural perspective. That is and is not. So he's so confused. Suddenly Sebastian looks at Antonio, who was standing there arrested. Antonio, oh my dear Antonio, how have the hours racked and tortured me since I have lost thee? So, see, we know that Sebastian loves Antonio and he was missing him and he was talking about him in his soliloquy. Sebastian, are you? Now, Antonio was so sad and suddenly he realizes that, okay, this is my friend and he recognizes me. So, this was not my friend. So, I made a mistake there. Fearest thou that, Antonio? You don't know I'm Sebastian? How have you made division of yourself? Back then they didn't have photocopy machines or 3D copiers. Uh, but this is what he's thinking that there's a copy machine. How have you made a division of yourself? An apple cleft in two is not more twin than these two creatures. If you cut an apple, the two sides don't look that similar. Sometimes there's a spot on one side, sometimes the shape is different. But these two are more similar than two apples, like two sides of the same apple. Oh, which is Sebastian? Most wonderful. Olivia is also like, she thinks she doesn't understand what's happening here. Now Sebastian looks at Viola. Sebastian has never seen his sister dressed as a man. So obviously he sees himself there. Okay, he doesn't recognize his sister as yet but he thinks that he's looking at himself do i stand there i never had a brother nor can there be that deity in my nature of here and everywhere i'm not god i'm a man i cannot be here and everywhere i don't have a brother i had a sister 
whom the blind waves and surges have devoured of charity. What kin are you to me? How are you related to me? What countryman, what name, what parentage of Messaline? Sebastian was my father. Such a Sebastian was my brother too. Now, this is a bit uh, far-fetched, you know. Viola should recognize Sebastian. She should rush away towards her and embrace him, right? But this is important for the audience because unless and until they get it clarified on stage, giving information to each other, how are we to know for sure that they are Sebastian and Viola? Because up till now, we have not seen Viola as Viola uh, when she is with people like Orsino, right? So in front of Orsino, it has to be proved too. Of Messaline, Sebastian was my father, such as Sebastian was my brother too. So my father's name was Sebastian, my brother's name was Sebastian. This happens uh, many times, you know, people uh, give up their names to their children. So went he suited to his watery tomb. He went to his watery tomb means he died by drowning. His tomb, his death bed was the ocean. If spirits can assume both form and suit, you come to fright us. I think you are a ghost who has come to frighten us. A spirit I am indeed. I am a spirit but I am not ghost. But am in that dimension grossly clad which from the womb I did participate. So I am a spirit but I am enclosed in the body which was born out of our mother's womb. Where you a woman as the rest goes even, I should my tears let fall upon your cheek and say thrice welcome drowned Viola. If you were a woman, I would say you are my sister whom I have lost. So of course, now we get her name for sure as confirmed. My father had a mole upon his brow and so had mine and died the day when Viola from her birth had numbered 13 years. Oh, that record is lively in my soul. So they are confirming each other's identities. He finished indeed his mortal act that day that made my sister 13 years. That is, they, they were twins, so both of them turned 13 that day. If nothing lets to make us happy both, but this my masculine usurped attire, do not embrace me. Wait, do not embrace me because I am still not your sister because I am wearing the stress of a man. Till each circumstance of place, time, fortune do cohere and jump that I am Viola. Let me become Viola. She is tired, sick of being Cesario. She is so relieved that her brother is there. Not just because her brother is alive, but because her brother's being alive means she can have her life back. Because she was living a double life and she was living a nightmare, especially since Olivia started to have this crush on her. Which to confirm, I'll bring you to a captain in his town. So this, she's now talking about that sea captain. Where well, lie my maiden weeds? I have kept my dress, my maiden dress, my girl's costumes with him. By whose gentle help I was preserved to serve this noble count. All the occurrence of my fortune since had been between this lady and this lord. So I have been here since then. She is explaining her situation here. So comes it, lady, you have been mistook. Now Sebastian looks at his wife and says, Okay, so you had made a mistake. But nature to her bias drew in that. But she is blessed because she did not end up making more mistakes. You would have been contracted to a maid. I mean, if I wasn't there, you would have been married to a woman. This is no laughing matter with all those LGBT rights going on up there, right? But if somebody is not a homosexual and they end up marrying a person of the same sex without intending to do that, well, that creates itself as a comic situation, doesn't it? Nor are you therein by my life deceived. You are betrothed both to a maid and a man. So you fell in love with a maid and you're married to a man. Be not amazed, right noble is his blood. If this be so, and yet the glass seems true, I shall have share in this most happy wreck. Why is the duke so happy? Boy, 
thou hast said to me a thousand times thou never shouldst love woman like to me now he is actually feeling relieved because all this while 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 he was declaring his love for olivia he was falling in love with this person who was attending him for these three months that's why he was jealous not because this cesario was taking olivia away from him he was jealous because cesario was going away from him and now he feels that there is my chance was that the reason that you were saying all these things to me that you love me more than any man can love a woman and all those things will i over swear and all those swearings keep as true in soul as doth that obt continent the fire obt continent ob means circular spherical so orbed continent in fire means sun so i will be saying that over and over again whatever i have told you that severs day from night so sun is responsible for separating day and night and i will uh, be as true as the sun i will be as constant oh now some very very emotional lines give me thy hand and let me see thee in thy woman's ways i want to you to become the real you the captain that did bring me first on shore had my maid's garments he upon some action is now in durance he is uh, in prison at malvolio's suit a gentleman and follower of my lady's so there was a problem with this sea captain between this sea captain and malvolio because of which he was arrested so now they are looking for malvolio that malvolio will come and the sea captain will bring the clothes of viola so it looks kind of forced forced as if shakespeare is trying to bring everybody on stage to have a complete resolution but this is also necessary because in comedy uh, when things get out of joint everything has to fall into place uh, to form that harmony in the comic universe now olivia asks others to bring malvolio now before malvolio comes uh, she also says that uh, malvolio has become a little bit of a distracted person now a mad person and right then fabian and clown enter with that letter feste comes and hands over the letter to olivia okay and uh i'll not waste much time in uh, explaining what goes on before this doesn't really matter much let's just read the letter okay the, the the clown or the fool he reads the letter so all of us we are hearing it by the lord madam how now art thou mad no madam i do but read madness and so this man is mad who has written this so i'm reading madness and your ladyship will have it as it ought to be you must allow vox so you must allow voice so obviously he is reading imitating the voice of malvolio and that is why olivia is saying are you mad just read it normally and then he says that no you have to have the impact pretty read in thy right wits so i do madonna so see the the fool always wants to talk about things before actually doing things anyway he talks too much and olivia is impatient so she takes that letter away gives it to fabian and says that just leave him you read it fabian reads it normally by the lord madam you wrong me and the world shall know it you have done injustice to me because malvolio thinks olivia sent him those letters those instructions to uh, do those things which he did and he ended up in prison or rather that madhouse uh, under the basement and he says that though you have put me into darkness he thinks that olivia has put him in darkness and given your drunken cousin rule over me yet have i the benefit of my senses as well as your ladyship i have your own letter that induced me to the semblance i put on now he talks about the letter he had received with the which i doubt not but to do myself much right or you much shame 
Think of me as you please. I leave my duty a little unthought of and speak out of my injury. The madly used Malvolio, uh, the abused Malvolio. Did he write this? Aye, madam. The, the way Orsino is now talking with Olivia or about Olivia's matters, there is not an ounce of hatred for Olivia. Not an ounce of jealousy here. He is not at all jealous that this guy Sebastian is married to Olivia. He has no problem. He is so happy that he has Cesario now for his own. So we really know who has uh, captured his heart, don't we? Anyway, uh, Arsino wants to uh, look into the matter because he is the duke and he says, this savors not much of distraction. No, this doesn't, this doesn't sound mad. This man has written in proper sentences. Olivia wants to meet Malvolio and Fabian goes away. He, wa he, he goes out to bring Malvolio. Now, while this is happening, Olivia, she is talking to the duke. She doesn't show any discomfort at all. They are all very, very happy about how things have turned out to be. My lord, so please you, these things further thought on to think me as well a sister as a wife. So please think of me as your sister. One day shall crown the alliance on it. So please you, here at my house and at my proper cost. Now, she is trying to create a bridge because she had a bad fight with Orsino. She wants to say that, please, let bygones be bygones. Please, you have to have your marriage ceremony, wedding ceremony at my place. I will sponsor your wedding. Madam, I am most apt to embrace your offer. So, she is now related to the Duke as sister-in-law okay because she is married to the duke's brother-in-law okay so this is how things are turning out to viola orsino says your master quits you well i just miss you and for your service done him so much against the metal of your sex you have done a lot of service to me against what your woman's roles are so far beneath your soft and tender breeding, you have done so much of uh, manual work for me. And since you called me master for so long, here is my hand. You shall from this time be your master's mistress. A sister, you are she. <laughs> I don't understand how Olivia, uh, Viola, they just somehow managed to think this as a rosy ending this is a very disturbing ending because every time if i was olivia every time i would look at viola i would think this is the person i fell in love with i mean but good for us they are happy if they are happy who are we to complain now malvolio comes is this the madman now when Malvolio enters, Orsino wants to know who this is. I, my lord, the same. How now, Malvolio? Madam, you have done me wrong. Notorious wrong. Have I, Malvolio? No. Lady, you have. Pray you, peruse that letter. You must not now deny it is your hand. Now Malvolio shows Olivia that letter. That letter which Maria had written, where it was written as if it was written by Olivia. Write from it, if you can, in hand or phrase or say it is not your seal, not your invention. This is not sealed by you. This is not signed by you. You can say none of this. Well, grant it then and tell me in the modesty of honor why you have given me such clear lights of favor. You, you gave me the idea that you are in love with me. You gave me these favors and now you are denying me this. So you are responsible. I am not mad. Bade me come smiling and cross gartered to you to put on yellow stockings and to frown upon Sir Toby and the lighter people and acting this in an obedient hope. Why have you suffered me to be imprisoned, kept in a dark house, visited by the priest and made the most notorious geck and gull that ever invention played on? Tell me why. He is so angry. Alas, Malvolio. This is not my writing. 
though I confess much like the character, yes, very much like my writing, but it is not written by me. But out of question is Maria's hand. And now I do bethink me it was she first told me thou was mad. Now she realizes that Malvolio's madness is a myth created by Toby and his people. It was she first told me thou was mad. Then camest in smiling and such forms which here were presupposed upon thee in the letter. Prithi, be content. This practice hath most shrewdly passed upon thee. She says, yes, you have been really wronged. But when we know the grounds and authors of it, thou shalt be both the plaintiff and the judge of thine own cause. We will get to the root of the matter. You will judge them. I am allowing you that. Okay. Now Fabian is not very comfortable with the situation because he was also a part of this. Good madam, hear me speak and let no quarrel nor no brawl to come taint the condition of this present hour. Oh, why are you talking about punishments now? You will be getting married and there will be this grand reception. We will all be enjoying having parties. Uh, let's not talk about these bad things now, right? So Fabian wants to postpone or just forget about all this or wants Olivia to forget about them. In hope it shall not most freely, I confess myself and Toby set this device against Malvolio here upon some stubborn and uncourteous parts we have conceived against him. Now he complains that Malvolio had been rude to us, uncivil to us and that's why we had planned this device on him. Maria read the letter at Sir Toby's great importance in recompense whereof he had married her. Toby also married Maria and it happens in Shakespeare, all kinds of marriages, all kinds of love. Uh, this is also a very important kind of marriage because here Maria is getting not just a husband but she is getting a social status that is very important for her. And we have seen Toby really likes Maria, doesn't he? How with a sportful malice it was followed may rather pluck on laughter than revenge. It's a matter of laughter. Let's not take it seriously. Olivia just says, alas poor fool, how have they baffled thee? Why? Some are born great, some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them. So this is something that was written in the letter and the clown, he repeats it. He just makes a minor change uh, thrown upon them instead of thrust upon them. He now says, I was one sir in this interlude, one sir topper sir, but that's all one. By the Lord fool, I am not mad, but do you remember? Madam, why laugh you at such a bad and rascal? So now he is telling Malvolio that you have forgotten what you have done to me, the things you have said to me. So that was my revenge. And you smile not, he is gagged. And thus the worldly gig of time, worldly gig means spinning top, like something which goes around, brings in his revenges. I will be revenged on the whole pack of you. Malvolio leaves. So on the stage we have happy people. Except Malvolio storms out and he's, he is not uh, brought in within this harmony. And that is why uh, we cannot call it a complete happy ending. It's not complete social assimilation. Uh, all the characters do not end up being happy. So there is an element of darkness. There is an element of cruelty within this canvas of festival. This is ending in festival and uh, this is the moment where the disguises are taken off and illusions are broken down. From the next morning, everybody will be their original selves. There will be no more deception, no more uh, role playing, uh, no more parties, okay, no more illusions, no more uh, being what you are not. So this is the time when you become uh, the person who will be what you will be. Okay, the, the, the title of this play is Twelfth Night or What You Will. And these characters, they were not till now what they were willing to be. Now this moment is the moment. This moment is the twelfth night of this twelfth night. When they can be what they are finally. Okay, taking off their disguises. Malvolio is not ready to change. And within the comic universe, if you are not ready to change, then you don't survive. Because 
even in paradise lost what was the problem with satan he had a fixed mind remember that he, he, he took pride in his fixed mind if you have read paradise lost you know what i'm talking about that his mind won't change so unchangeability is not christian christians change they repent and they confess their sins and the moment they confess they realize their mistakes they are given grace by god they are forgiven they are brought into the comic universe malvolio does not accept his mistake so he has to leave others are happy pursue him and entreat him to appease he hath not told us of the captain yet so the duke is more interested in viola's clothes when that is known and golden time convents a solemn combination shall be made of our dear souls he declares a marriage ceremony wedding ceremony officially uh, to be conducted in very near future meantime sweet sister and now he is talking to olivia directly as sweet sister meantime sweet sister we will not part from hence we are going to stay in a place we are not going to go from here cesario come for so you shall be while you are a man but when in other habits you are seen habit means dress i told you orsino's mistress and his fancy's queen so till then i will be treating you as cesario and somehow i feel that he really likes cesario as cesario okay uh, they all leave but the play doesn't end here because twelfth night doesn't end right with festivities it also is the marking point of a, a beginning a new beginning and what is a new beginning if not a cycle of life and the song which we have at the end of it is all about this cycle of life and who sings that everybody leaves so first malvolio leaves is very angry storming out then all the other people leave happy mood and then in a melancholy philosophical mood we have the fool standing the wisest of men in illyria the most underrated character in the play the most loved of shakespeare's fools what does he sing when that i was and a little tiny boy with hey ho the wind and the rain a foolish thing was but a toy for the rain it raineth every day so when i was young and small it used to rain every day so life was not a bed of roses there were rainy days and rainy days are symbols of hardships but when i came to a man's estate when i grew up with hey ho the wind and the rain against knaves and thieves men shut their gate for the rain it raineth every day so when i grew up i saw men was trusting each other uh, against knaves and thieves men shut their gate so i was getting aware that you need to be cautious you need to grow up but when i came a last to wife when i got married with hey ho the wind and the rain by swaggering could i never thrive for the train it raineth every day that he was unsuccessful even as a husband but when i came man to my beds so when i became old with hey ho the wind and the rain with tus pot still had drunken heads for the rain it raineth every day now because my life is always full of misery i always have the hardships even in my prime age when i have grown up so much when i have become so old life is all the same for me a great while ago the world began with hey ho the wind and the rain but that's all one our play is done and we'll strive to please you every day he is now directly talking to us and he is not just talking about his life he's talking about the whole world this world started one fine day and there were miseries and there were problems and then we have these plays to to just ease you out of your worries because no matter how much rain you have in your life you can always come back to the globe theater and watch this play okay so he is talking about this promise of performance 
and the promise of performance is something which keeps the energy going it's like a cycle of life people walking out of the theater with music in their ears and i didn't sing this of course because i really want you to uh, listen to this song it's available on youtube and uh, there are many versions but i like the version uh, which i i'll try to give a screenshot of that uh, version you can look it up because i cannot technically share that in my video for copyright issues i loved that version it has all the sad notes in it and all the melancholic notes in it and also the promise of rejuvenation so with every 12th night comes awareness of reality of of stepping into life and also an assurance that there will be another christmas and there will be another performance so this promise of performance is 12th night and this promise is the biggest of commitments that a dramatist can make so here shakespeare through the voice of the fool is speaking to you about the cycle of life about the miseries of life and about 12th nights all right so i really enjoyed this uh, play uh, discussing its lines uh, i was reliving my college days i was thinking about my wonderful teacher i want to name her once again her name is indrani choudhury datto and if uh, any of you are from lady pribon college she is still a teacher there uh, she was the best i could ever dream of and i just wish i could do justice to this play um, i just shared with you whatever i thought about the lines i want to make analysis videos on character of viola or uh, character of orsino uh, and other things other aspects of this play uh, meanwhile you can have a look at some of the articles which i have written and posted online i'll give the links in the description box you know how to watch the description box don't you it has been a very long video so i won't stretch it any further i really thank you for your lovely comments and i really really feel so happy that we have uh, finally managed to complete this play within july because many of you had said that you have exams in august all the very best from me lots of blessings i'm expecting all of you to subscribe stay happy stay safe till our next video this is monavi mukherjee signing off